Gothic lit. This is book support one for Gothic literature, and we are going to talk about chapters one and two of We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. So far in chapter one, we have met our narrator, which is Maricat. She is an oddball. She's a very strange narrator. We know right away that she's odd because she thinks that her two fingers making the same length means that with any luck, she might have been a werewolf. Uh, she looks at the entire town as though it's a large board game. She often wishes she was on the moon and her entire family is dead. We have a hard time understanding her because she has a difficult to follow voice. She's either immature or mature. She seems to talk like she's a little child saying that she likes fairy tales and she pretends the world is a board game and she believes in werewolves. But then she's obviously old enough to go into town and buy all of the groceries. So. There's, there's something going on. She's clearly not as young as she'd like to think. She goes into the town. The townspeople obviously treat her very poorly. She goes into the grocery store where it feels like everybody stops, stares directly at her, and watches her slowly but surely get waited on first by the people who are operating the grocery store. Maricat, to deal with the stares, says that she pretends they're all sick and dying, writhing in horrible pain on the grocery store floor, which is a very strange image. Um, and of course we have no real understanding why the tension exists. We should pick up immediately when she says, sugar, and everybody stops and she even hears somebody gasp in the background. So that should be a little detail that you pick up. I'll talk about details in a few minutes. She then goes to Stella's to get coffee, and while Mary Cat is drinking, two men from the village come in, Jim and Joe. They are obviously there to tease and torment Mary Cat, which then begs that she can't really be a small child because full-grown adults don't pick on little kids. An interesting tie from Stella to Mary Cat is, if you notice, Stella has a marble countertop and a really beautiful golden coffee urn that she bought when she got insurance from her husband's death. Now, obviously, we're not to read that Stella killed her husband so she could go out and buy a cop, like a marble countertop for her, her cafe, but there's a tie there. Uh, Mary Cat and her sister live in the house that they inherited from their dead parents, and the town hates them. Stella works in the coffee shop that she inherited from, or could improve, from her dead husband, and the town loves her. So we have kind of parallel going on, and we have to stop and think, like, one has a socially acceptable death, and one does not have a socially acceptable death. That's a hint that Shirley Jackson's giving you in this nice little small detail. Um, she finally leaves because Stella tells her to leave, not in a rude way, but she says, you go on home now. And as she's walking out, she can hear all of them laughing, which should imply to the reader, Stella might not be a good friend. Jackson's work is really best described as the devil's in the details. You want to pay attention to something. If Mary Cat says she's chilled, you should pay attention to that because she's going to talk about being chilled an awful lot and there's a really good insight to that. Moving forward, um, we go into chapter two. Mary Cat has arrived home and she takes great pains to let the reader know that she lives nowhere near the town. She lives up in the woods and you can tell by the big black rock. She gets up, she goes through the gate, the wire gate, makes sure that the door is clearly secured behind her and then proceeds to go up towards the house where she meets her older sister Constance, the very beautiful older sister Constance. And Constance is so excited because she finally walked to the end of the garden today. Constance can walk, there's nothing wrong with her, but it is interesting that both she and Mary Cat think it's so fascinating that she got all the way from her house. This is at most 30 feet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess if that's 30 feet from her house. That should be another little detail telling the audience something weird is going on. Two guests come in for tea, and this is where we have the world's strangest tea party. Constance has made very delicious cookies and very yummy tea. Now, Mary Cat cannot eat in the presence of people, so she sits in the corner and doesn't take tea and doesn't have cookies, but she sits in the corner like some strange little owl watching the entire event. Constance entertains the two women who try to encourage her to go out into town, cautiously alluding to something in the past, telling Constance your penance is over. 
We, the audience, are completely in the blank as to what any of these three are talking about, and Maricat is not helping us out in the least. Shirley Jackson is beautiful for that. She gives you narrators who are convinced that the reader should just know enough, and you don't have to know any more. And it's lovely, and it's wonderful, and it's great. It's like a mystery slowly unraveling in front of you. Or a sweater slowly unraveling in front of you, which is even more fun. Uncle Julian comes into the room. Uncle Julian is a great character. He's in a wheelchair. He is obviously disabled, and he's very sick. Uh, Uncle Julian has suffered from arsenic poisoning, and that's why he's weakened, and that's why he's sick, and that's why he can't really eat different types of food. I think the guy lives off of eggs at this point, and, and milk. Um, he comes in and starts to have a, a, a nice conversation with the women, but slowly starts to feed them scary information, saying things like, it was that very dining room. As a matter of fact, it was that very sugar bowl from which we all took the sugar, except of course my niece Constance, who never takes sugar. At which point, Mary Cat, very funnily handling somebody a cup of tea, goes, sugar? The two women eventually become so frustrated and so scared by Uncle Julian, what his bad behavior is, that they get up and they just storm out. Now, the great thing was, before they had shown up, one woman made a great point of pointing out like, oh, look at the staircase, it's beautiful, and look at those lovely cathedral windows, and isn't this lace doily amazing, da 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 da. Like, she's giving a tour of a museum to her friend. That's a really interesting thing that Shirley Jackson's talking about, too. That sometimes we think we own information about other people, and that it's our job to be the stewards or the governors of that information, as though I know a secret about my friend. And so I get to decide who I tell that secret to. Uh, so they leave, and that's, that's the end of that chapter. And it's great because Uncle Julian turns to Constance and goes, did I do it all right? And Constance says, you did fine, Uncle Julian. You didn't even need the notes. Constance controlled, wrote, scripted that whole scene to make sure that those women never came back to tea. What I would like you to do in chapter two, which you're reading for homework this week, and you will read because I didn't tell you everything that happened in chapter two. A lot more actually happens in it, so you better make sure you do because there will be a quiz waiting for you on Tuesday. Your assignment for this weekend is to go into the book and I want you to find a passage where you think there's an important small detail. You know, Mary Cat bought cookies. Of course she bought cookies, who cares? Um, Mary Cat buys a lot of interesting groceries. Most of the groceries are throwaway details. She buys flour. Of course she bought flour. Of course she bought milk. Of course she bought eggs. Of course she did. But there's a couple of things where she says that particular item, and it's like the whole world stopped. Now, you don't have to take from the grocery store. As a matter of fact, you can't take from the grocery store because that's chapter one. I want you to go into chapter two, and I want you to find one small detail. I want you to write it down on a piece of paper, the whole sentence, and cite it properly, so Jackson, comma, number of page. And then I want you to write down all of the reasons that this detail might be important. I want you to do all of our great good reader things. Analyze the word choice. Try to make a prediction. Try to find a deeper connection to another text. Try to draw a conclusion from why this is there. Do all of those great good reader skills, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. No cheating. I know what Sparknotes and Smoop has on it, so don't play with me.